All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Schaefer. I'm an attorney with Polaro Maza. Um, we are gonna give it another minute. I think people are trickling in and then uh, we'll get started. Thank you. All right, great. Well, let's get started. Thank you very much for joining us. This is our webinar, the state of affairs for data privacy, trends in state legislation and what they mean. We're actually also be talking a little bit about the federal legislative landscape, the regulatory landscape associated with that, a little bit of GDPR with regards to the European Union and their previous regulatory um, actions that are really actually influencing a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. So. Uh, don't be deceived by just stay legislations. We're going to talk about a little bit of everything. As I mentioned initially, my name is Dave. I have my associate here, Emily, and we are in the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice Group here at Polaro Maza. We are also in the corporate group. So um, we are particularly suited to talk about the intersection of those two con concepts and, and kind of making sure that we give some, what I like to think, practical advice with regards to cybersecurity and data privacy compliance. So let's just talk generally on an overview of what we intend to cover with this webinar. As I just alluded to, there are gonna be some things that we touch upon that aren't necessarily state uh, related, but it's important that we kind of give you a, a full context of, of where this started, where we are now, and where we're going to go. And I think that that's going to allow you to kind of understand a little bit more predictive modeling as to where we think that legislatures are going to be acting, if you understand, again, kind of the overarching context. And so you can prepare accordingly. So as you see, we're going to get into a lot of variables, a large variety of regulatory and contractual obligations that are going to be really specific and that are going to need to be tailored to your particular organization and your particular organization's objectives, its position, its industry, its size, things along those lines. And so while we're going to start and we're going to talk a lot in general terms and with overall nature, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to us. We are able to see them real time. If we're able to answer, we will do so. Um, if not, we'll make sure to reach out to you following this webinar to circle up with any sort of um, answers that may be more specific to your particular situation. So again, the overview, we're gonna talk about cybersecurity and data privacy and where they are kind of more in your small business and, and mid-market business um, risk profiles. We're going to make a quick distinction between cybersecurity and data privacy in general, because while those two are interrelated, um, they do have some nuances that are that are independent of each other that really um, bear highlighting. Um, data, privacy, data privacy laws in the U.S. and where things stand, the GDPR, as we mentioned, the CCPA, which is one of the, as, as I would imagine a lot of people know, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which again, we'll talk to in a bit, is really what spurred a lot of other state legislations and what seems to be leading the way within the United States with regards to data privacy. Other states' laws, again, a lot of states following the California model, upcoming legislation, impacts of legislations, and of course, some strategies and recommendations for compliance, some takeaways, some practical advice with regards to how can you digest this broad landscape and work it into something that hopefully is a little bit more manageable for your organization. All right, so why are cybersecurity and data privacy important? So, you know, I, I would say that the best way to really think about this is to analogize it to other risks and other regulatory regimes that your company or organization is already used to compliance with. If you think about it like tax or environmental, uh, originally those issues were not as material, but over the course of various legislative sessions, they become much more intrusive into the operations of a business for various public policy 
or other regulatory reasons. So the increasing regulatory landscape that we see right now centers on a couple different models. And on the cybersecurity front, we're now at all 50 states. I think the last two states just crossed the finish line at the end of 2018. All 50 states plus the District of Columbia plus Puerto Rico all have breach notification statutes. So if there were an obligate, if there were a breach of, say, personally identifiable information, which we we'll talk about momentarily, is different depending on what jurisdiction you're in. If you were to suffer any sort of breach, there are statutory and regulatory requirements that you notify the affected individuals or affected third parties. And in some jurisdictions provide uh, identity theft monitoring, credit report monitoring for various different time periods. So we've seen very active attorney generals in this space, particularly in Connecticut, with regards to requiring a two-year credit monitoring for all affected individuals. And that's really spread like wildfire, frankly, over the past five to 10 years with regards to these breach notifications. Interestingly as well, the Federal Trade Commission over the past five years or so decided that under Section 5 of the FTC Act, uh, any sort of cybersecurity violation is now unfair um, competition or it's unfair trade practice. And therefore, they've started to take enforcement action. And a lot of the case law that we see that is guiding some of um, the advice that we typically give clients comes from these FTC actions related to how they're interpreting um, the FTC Act. We'll also talk a little bit, why are they important? Biometric information, we, again, alluding to Personally identifiable information, which you hear a lot, is what we really care about. That's the data that we want to keep private um, for over simplicity, but that's the data that we really want to keep private. And biometric information, fingerprints, facial recognition software, these types of things have started to come into play. Um, Illinois is a great example. Illinois has a Biometric Privacy Act that includes a private right of action and some um, statutory damages. And so we've seen a lot of litigation come out of that with regards to lack of proper policies, lack of individual consent, those types of things. And while Illinois is leading the pack with regards to biometric privacy, we've actually seen some legislation in Texas and some other jurisdictions that give us the insight that biometric privacy is really going to be another thing that comes into this overarching you know, privacy uh, data rights kind of web. It's not necessarily within the scope of today's webinar, but it's certainly something to keep in mind as we talk about personally identifiable information, the definition of what is personally identifiable information, how states define that, how regulatory bodies define that, and, and how biometric uh, information is going to be lumped into that eventually, and in some jurisdictions already has. You know, PII is no longer you know, name, social security number, birthday, or, or those kind of items that, that we would typically and traditionally identify as personally identifiable information, um, like it was when the beginning of all of these statutes and regulations started to be promulgated. It's really extending much more beyond that. And if you think about it, it makes sense as you know the technical world and technology itself has advanced and, and the way that we create and distribute information itself has has advanced correspondingly, which really ties into the next point, commoditization of information. This really speaks to that current economic climate, the business realities of the economy and the global economy that we all live in. Someone far smarter than me and, and has said that, you know, if if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. It's your data, it's your PII, it's that information that you give in order to gain access to a service or to a product that is actually the revenue generating aspect for that particular company. And as that becomes much more commonplace, you know, state bodies are looking at how to regulate that and, and how to adjust to the current economic climate. And that's one of the things that CCPA in particular speaks directly to. It's really, you know, a consumer protection act how do we protect our consumers who are giving all this information uh, in exchange for these products or services? So that's really kind of the overarching intent to be responsive 
to the current business climate. And, and finally, competitive edge. This is something that we here at Polaro Mazda, we've been discussing um, a, a little bit and increasingly so over the past year or so with regards to how do our clients distinguish themselves from you know, competitors, uh, distinguish themselves and highlight themselves in front of the eyes of customers and employees and, and, and the like. And what we're really talking about is compliance. If you're able to say it and others are not, whether it's CMMC level five or, or whatever the case may be, ISO certifications, there's all kinds of different certifying bodies out there that will be able to allow you to demonstrate your superiority in the face of competition. And so that's one of the things when we bring it home to the practical implications of what CCPA and all these privacy regulations discuss, how are we compliant? How do you use that in order to be a, a, a competitive business, a competitive bidder, things along those lines? Contracting officers and prime contractors looking at an entity um, really talking about how do you differentiate yourself from your competition and you differentiate yourself by having those types of things and minimizing the risk for your prime contractor, minimizing the risk for your uh, government client and really talking about those different types of risk mitigation strategies. And when I say risks, I really think of four general buckets, the legal risks, uh, reputational risks, op operational risks and, and investment risks. So it's becoming much more of a substantive issue. It's becoming analyzed and reviewed upon a lot more. And it's something that with the proper prepara preparation, to, we can just stay ahead of and make sure that um, we're always taken care of. All right, let's see what's next. What do we mean by cybersecurity and data privacy? So we get this question a lot because again, they do intersect quite a bit. You know, cybersecurity is really focused on the act, the, the act of unauthorized access, the exfiltration of sensitive or proprietary data, confidential data, personal identifiable information. It's, it covers all of those different types of facets. It's really a lot broader than a lot of people give it credit for it because it deals with not only that sensitive information, it also deals with non-sensitive information. So that kind of narrowly covers the cybersecurity piece. On the privacy, what we're really talking about are these general principles, right? And, and when we look at these principles, we're really focused on the information and we're focused on the individual who has given you that information. So when we talk about, and you'll see, these are the themes that run through a lot of the legislation that we see. We're focused on accountability. Is the company accountable to the customer, to the individual who has given you the personally identifiable information? How are you accountable? Do you reporting mechanisms, any sort of, what are your responses to customer inquiries, things along those lines. Focused collection, are you collecting just the information that you actually need in order to perform the process or processes that you told the person that you were going to use with that? It's inappropriate to collect all the information, for example, a social security number, if it's just not necessary. Access and accuracy, access, who on your team has access to it? Why do they have access to it? Did you limit the access? to the individuals that are absolutely necessary to have that accuracy. Again, who can make changes to this information? We'll make sure that we maintain data integrity. Security, encryption at rest, encryption in transit. Um, we have a, you know, you can anonymize the data. You can take various different steps to provide the security of the information, again, on behalf of the customer. Data quality, how are you storing it? Are you storing it intact? Is it encrypted? Are we making sure, again, there's another integrity piece. Transparency, that's really your informed consents with regards to um, the individuals who are giving you their personally identifiable information or other sensitive, sensitive information. They need to know what you're going to do with it. And individual control. Individual control is a little bit along those lines uh, with transparency in that 
the statutes and regulations really hammer in the um, consent requirements. There's notice requirements, consent requirements, opt-in and opt-out, whether that's under certain jurisdictions and certain statutes, you have to, somebody has to opt in, say, to a mailing or to um, receiving push notifications to, re to allowing cookies to be placed onto their machine, or they have to opt out, you know, which entity has the affirmative obligation. And again, that really depends on the jurisdiction. But what, again, what we're talking about is the individual has that control. So on a privacy macro perspective, we're really talking about sensitive information and who gets to control that. And we're focused almost exclusively on the individual, the holder of such information. So the current state of data privacy laws in the US, as, as I imagine that a lot of you know, is that we have a very piecemeal approach. We have various states and uh, activist attorney generals who are implementing statutes and regulations that apply to the citizens of their state, of the businesses that are doing business in that state, whether they're formed in that state or they're qualified to do business as a foreign entity that are operating and interacting with the citizens that fall under that particular legislature's province. We have a lot of that. We also have a rising number of industry panels, industry um, standards and organizations that have taken hold that in the absence of certain legislation, legislative initiatives, courts are given a lot of credence to. So while, for example, the NIST 800-171 um, with its SSP requirements and other discussions with regards to the CUI, while that might not be the uh, legal requirement Courts are tending to look at that now and say, yes, but it's a wonderful example of what, what the legal term is reasonable, or the reasonable um, preparedness of the entity. And that's really the standard when you go in front of the FTC or you go in front of another tribunal with, with, with an incident, you say, yes, but I took reasonable standards. That's what required of entities. And so in light of the fact and the absence of, of certain legislative initiatives, all of these industry organizations and the rules that they promulgate are becoming a lot more important. And like I said, we talked about the regulations and statutes that, that cover uh, the states and the various jurisdictions that come into play. The federal sectoral approach, you know, the federal sectoral approach, the sectoral approach is exactly what um, the name implies. You have no overarching federal legislation, and we can speak to that a little bit later, but without any sort of overarching federal legislation, there's no preemption, there's no uh, any of those legal concepts that would make one unifying comprehensive model. So we are left with the sectoral approach. Um, anyone in a regulated industry is already likely very familiar with some of these statutes. It becomes a little dangerous when you move from one industry to another or you dip into another industry for a little bit or you um, have a contractual arrangement with another entity that is in that industry we get that in particular a lot when one of our clients is presented with a baa um, to comply with hipaa and they've got nothing to do with healthcare. so just as a brief overview we've got the fair credit reporting act which really talks about consumer access to credit reports we have hipaa again which is healthcare the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, Financial Services. We have COPPA, or the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, online websites and services is that geared towards. The Federal Trade Commission Act, again, Section 5 deals with unfair and deceptive trade practices. Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act, that's the CAN-SPAM Act. We see a lot of that with regards to mass mail marketing. Um, FERPA, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, that's mostly for higher education. And one, uh, and, and then of course, that many people are likely aware, we've got our FAR and DFAR um, regulations that are out there that have been implemented to talk to these privacy um, acts. Now, again, because there is no overarching federal privacy legislation, and because the GDPR has been somewhat well received throughout the world. California started it off, but we are seeing a lot of very active state legislatures. Emily will speak to that momentarily, but in the absence of the federal government taking action, the states have taken it upon themselves to sponsor what 
in many times are wildly different um, legislative initiatives. So as I alluded to in the very beginning, we talk about the EU's GDPR, not because we're gonna get into the specifics, but because it has had a material impact and influence on what the state legislatures are doing. And that's mostly because of its comprehensive nature. So the GDPR really vests control of information back into the, the individuals. Now, I say that you use GDPR, but technically it applies to the European economic area, which includes a couple countries just outside of the EU. But it covers every all of those countries and every citizen within those countries. And it has data protection authorities and it has a regulatory model in order to follow through on that. It and contains certain rights all towards the individual. And the biggest impact that we're seeing from our perspective within the United States is the definition of personally identifiable information. Again, five, 10 years ago, PII was some of the more basic name, social security number, birth date, address, those types of things that would reasonably identify an individual and perhaps um, allow a, an authorized holder of that information to open a credit card or, or take specific action against them. But under the GDPR, the definition of personally identifiable is incredibly broad. It is essentially any information that a reasonable person would be able to have and lead to knowing who you are. That's sexual orientation. That is political ide ideology. That is whether you're part of a union or not. In, and that's all in addition to, again, your insurance information, your health information, your, your name, your address, your social security number, or the equivalent within the EU. So that comprehensive nature, that everything about the individual, that really, that PII definition, as we'll get to, is starting to flow through the states as more states come on board and say, I really like that. I want to protect California citizens with that. And as Emily may touch on, in, Cal in the CCPA, the definition of PII is actually broader in the sense that it includes um, certain device information, IP addresses, and a lot more technical piece. Um, data transfer and safe harbors, this is always one of the things that I like to bring up. Again, it's not necessarily germane to this webinar per se, but data transfer and safe harbors, this all came about, uh, the, the GDPR really came about because the governments within the European, within the EEA, decided that they weren't comfortable with sharing, with their citizens sharing their personal information to the United States. Uh, mostly due to the Patriot Act legislation that gave our government broad access to such information that was imported. And so, accordingly, any company that's doing business and that falls under the, the regulatory regime of this GDPR cannot transmit data to the United States unless a variety of conditions are met, one of them being binding corporate rules, um, one is the explicit written consent of the individual. There's a lot of other kind of workarounds from a legal perspective, but it does become somewhat of an issue um, with regards to inhibiting global commerce. And so regardless of where you may do business, this happens a lot actually with cloud computing, but it's always something to just keep in the back of your head if you're ever reaching out to somebody within that part of the world. So the California, California Consumer Privacy Act, um, I'm just going to give a real quick kind of background and then I'll, I'll kick it over to Emily. But the interesting thing about the CCPA and if anyone who's tracking it has really under, watched and tracked the amendments um, that have been coming out and we've seen, you know, a, well more than a dozen amendments since the um, since the execution and the CCPA was passed in 2018, um, effective January 1 of 2020, is that this actually started as a ballot initiative uh, and under California law, there are various lo pretty, pretty low thresholds with regards to um, what it takes to get onto a general election ballot initiative. And so the this Cyber Act, uh, pardon me, CCPA was originally crafted as a ballot initiative that activists put um, and were 
very close to passing before the California state legislature said, well, we can't let the ballot initiative carry the day because then we lose control over what this initiative says and how we're going to implement it and things along those lines. I believe the ballot initiative was actually originally intended to be an amendment to the California Constitution. And so what they did was they slapped together the CCPA real quick. They put it through. They passed it throughout the legislature. And for the past two years, they've been playing catch up with a variety of amendments and saying, well, when we said that, we didn't really mean it. We just didn't. We just wanted to preempt the ballot initiative. And so we've had a lot of amendments throughout the past couple of years, and we anticipate a lot more of amendments coming down the pike um, during FY 2020 as well. But for some of the more specifics, I'm going to turn it over to Emily now, um, who's going to go through that. Hi, everyone. So as a background of the CCPA, um, as Dave gave the procedural history, the bill itself also gives some interesting history and information as to the purpose behind it. The legislature included information about California's background and why they wanted to include the information that they did in the CCPA. So first, it's interesting to note that um, the right of privacy is included in the California Constitution. So they have an explicit um, explicit provision to cite to as to why they want to include a law like this. Um, and the CCPA notes that fundamental to this right of privacy is the ability of individuals to control the use and sale of personal information. So with that, as Dave mentioned, there is a broad definition of personal information in the CCPA. So it includes everything, as Dave mentioned, from your name, your social security number, your address, phone number, um, and those sort of things that we normally think of with our personal information. But the act also includes um, any protected classifications under California or federal law. So as Dave mentioned, sexual orientation, your race, your gender, those things fall under the definition of personal information under the CCPA. The CCPA also explicitly includes biometric information, geolocation data, and professional or employment related information. And a note on the last one, professional or employment related information to kind of preview some of the amendments that we'll talk about. Um, there is an amendment that passed uh, to the CCPA that excludes employment related information from the definition of consumer. So again, broad definition, but we're seeing things change the definitions um, maybe refine the categories of information that are encompassed by the CCPA as we're moving forward. Um, in addition to a broad definition of personal information, the CCPA broadly defines consumer. So consumer is defined as a natural person who is a California resident. So as long as you're a resident of California, this law applies to you. Yeah, and I think that, that goes to Emily's point just now that the legislature then said, well, does that does that apply to the company's actual employees? Because they're the employees are not consumers, but under the definition of consumers, it can reasonably read to include your own employees. And so, I think that amendment was actually just signed uh, about a month ago. And so, again, this is going to continue to change, but. Um, and hopefully get narrowed and narrowed and have some guidance so that people can actually take some more concrete action. But for the time being, we're left dealing with some of this ambiguity. So in addition to these broad and ambiguous definitions, um, the CCPA also applies to businesses and the law defines a business or a, an applicable business under the CCPA as a business or sole proprietorship, an LLC, any type of entity that you can think of that has annual gross revenues of more than $25 million or annually buys, receives, sells, shares, or shares personal information of more than 50,000 consumers, households, or devices. Or the third threshold is if that business um, earns more than 50% of its revenues from selling personal information. So there are three different buckets that a business could fall under um, to fall under the purview of the CCPA. Um, now that we've covered some of the definitions, um, briefly what the CCPA does is it grants consumers the right to request a business that 
to disclose the categories and pieces of information it collects. It gives consumers the right to request a business to disclose the third parties that the information is shared to. Um, businesses are required to disclose that information in purpose if requested by consumers. Um, consumers can opt out of the sale of personal information. Um, there are anti-discrimination provisions in the CCPA, so if a consumer opts out of having their information shared or sold, a business cannot discriminate against that consumer for asserting those rights under the law. Um, and it also requires businesses that fall under the definition, so meet that fall into any of those three buckets, to put a clear and conspicuous link on their website, do not sell my personal information to allow consumers to exercise that opt out. Um, so those are some of the general background of the CCPA. And I think Dave is gonna talk a little bit about some preparation steps. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as I mentioned, it's coming into effect January 1, 2020. And while we do anticipate a lot of amendments, it's important to start the preparatory phase if you think that you uh, it, that the CCPA applies to you or your business. And I think, frankly, a lot of these kind of preparatory steps apply across the board, or at least are prudent across the board, something to think about incorporating into the future, as we know that other states are going to be a lot more active in this space. The first of which is, you know, determine who you are under the CCPA. You could be a covered business, you could be a third party provider, a service provider, and there are different obligations that you have, whether a contract or consent with the individual, contract with that third party or the entity that gets the information. Where are you in this ecosystem and how do you protect yourself? The second, update your vendor contracts. Vendor contracts, vendor management plans, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end, but vendor contracts, you need to specify the business purpose. It needs to prohibit the other party. For example, if you are the one bringing in individual or consumer information, you have to make sure that anyone who has access to that is not selling that information, that they're only retaining, using, and disclosing that information for the stated purpose. You've got to really limit your third parties via contract to make sure that whatever they are doing with that information, ultimately the liability falls on you as the collector of that information. And so you wanna make sure that your contract between the two parties is, is solidified so that any damages that come to you, you've got an identification privilege to go against them. Uh, the next is update your privacy policy. As Emily said, there are a lot of very specific nuances that are set forth in the statute that talk about how you have to make this clear and conspicuous to the individuals, what rights they have, how you're gonna use the information, what is their ability to opt out of this. You have to go through and really update these privacy policies, your terms, of, terms and conditions on your website, your privacy policies, the policies internal with your employees that yes, while we don't believe that employees will be in the definition of consumers, that they still have, you still have their sensitive information. Next, enable consumer requests, engagement, and opt out of data sales. This goes again back to the control is really being pushed to the individual. It's opt ins instead of opt outs, it's the right to be forgotten, don't sell my data. Those are the different types of rights that people are really looking towards and that are required. And again, you have to make it clear and conspicuous. You have to train your employees and your staff how to respond to a consumer who has made that request. You wanna respond in a timely manner. You wanna show compliance. And so you wanna get your employees trained on that, which leads to the last kind of big takeaway, implement employee training. Employee training is a big piece of this not and it's a big piece of any company with regards to the other kind of regulatory burdens that that beset uh, any company particularly a small business that you've got to let them know that this is this this is the law now this is what required of us and it's also important to note when we talk about these steps the ccpa provides for um, essentially statutory damages 
of I believe seventy five hundred dollars per violation. So if you, you know, um, don't get, obtain the consent of one individual, they can take you to court for seventy five hundred dollars, and that's a flat plus whatever damages they may or may not or may have incurred, um, and that they can prove as as a course of that. And then that's just one individual. And of course, if you if this falls under you, you've probably got about fifty thousand. So you can do the math. I'm not a mathematician, but you can see how it adds up, and it could lead to some pretty significant risk, um, which frankly could be solved with just some updates of the policies and, and some good business judgment. I think now uh, we're going to move on to some other states and how they're either kind of modeling off of CCPA, um, how they're taking that and kind of launching a platform or what how they approach it. So since the CCPA passed, um, we've seen information that about 25 states have introduced their own legislation concerning data privacy. Um, even though half the states have introduced such legislation, um, very, very few have actually passed those laws. Um, so as you can see from our slides, California obviously passed the CCPA. Um, Maine passed a law, um, but it applies only to internet service providers. So it targets a, a more narrow industry and um, more narrow set of businesses. Nevada is the third state that has passed a data privacy law. Um, it was signed by the governor in May of, tw of this year, 2019. Um, Nevada's existing laws required that an internet website operator make a notice of avail um, regarding which information is being collected. But the new law also requires an operator to establish a request address through which a consumer can submit verified request directing the operator to not make a sale of covered information. So it's, you know, similar to some of the requirements in the CCPA. Um, again, it's more narrow because it applies to internet website operators rather than having this large definition of businesses or different categories that a business could fall under. But there are opt-out provisions, a transparency requirement for those that are covered by Nevada's law. There's a data breach um, notification component to the law, and there are also penalty provisions. So the attorney general can seek injunctive relief and civil pen penalties against anyone that violates the Nevada statute. Um, there were additional states that were expected to pass laws, um, such as Connecticut, North Dakota, and Texas, but these three states, in addition to Hawaii and Louisiana, ultimately created task forces or some sort of information gathering body to study consumer privacy and data privacy protections. So in Connecticut, um, the legislature had proposed a bill that looked very much like the CCPA, it was very broad, very comprehensive. It was a consumer privacy bill, um, but ultimately there was a substitute bill establishing a task force concerning consumer privacy that passed instead. Um, Connecticut is expecting a report from that task force on January 1st, so we'll see what happens um, pending the results of that of that task force, their research, their recommendations. Um, Hawaii also adopted a task force to study the issue of consumer privacy and data privacy. Um, interestingly, there is a comprehensive bill currently pending in Hawaii as well. So we'll have to keep an eye on, on the results of their task force information and how it may affect the pending bill or whether the pending bill will get passed before the task force issues their recommendations. Louisiana also um, created a task force to study the issue, but had no pen other pending legislation. So it took the small step of establishing the task force, but um, did not have other bills with consumer privacy protections in place. Um, North Dakota, Similarly to Connecticut, had a comprehensive bill relating to protection of personal information. Um, it also would have protected against the disclosure of that information and provide a penalty. Um, but an amendment completely changed that proposed bill, removed all of those provisions, and instead uh, created a legislative management study. So North Dakota, like Connecticut, sort of hit the brakes and, and wanted to see what, what this um, this group would find. 
Um, again, similarly, Texas actually had two different bills. One was focused on consumer privacy and one was uh, focused on privacy protection. So Texas was kind of covering the, the scope of the issues through two different bills. Again, very comprehensive and similar to the CCPA. Those were ultimately replaced with a task force as well. So one of the bills were was amended so much um, by the Texas legislature that all data privacy provisions were ultimately removed or wouldn't have had any impact. Um, and so the Texas legislature seemingly punted on the questions by creating the task force and then hopefully would re readdress the issue. But um, it was interesting to see that those states that had had comprehensive bills sent to committee being reviewed um, ultimately decide to take a step back and go with a task force or some sort of study instead. Mm -hmm. um, the next category that we've looked at are states that have proposed but have not yet passed any type of data privacy bill. Um, notably out of the list that you'll see in our slides, only um, New Mexico's bill is dead as it stands, it has been postponed indefinitely by the New Mexico legislature. Um, for the other states that you'll see, so Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and Washington, um, there are bills that have stalled in committees, but the legislation isn't completely dead, either because um, it is expected that the legislation will be revived in the new session, or the legislative session hasn't ended yet, so the legislation is still pending. So for example, in Massachusetts and New Jersey, those legislatures are still in session. So even though the proposed bills have seemingly stalled in committee, um, there's a chance that they will go forward. Um, and more specifically with respect to Massachusetts, um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about this pending legislation and, you know, to tie into the last slide with Massachusetts, um, it's important to note that there were hearings um, last month on October 7th um, about the bill. Um, Massachusetts legislatures heard from various businesses and industries. Uh, people attending the hearing expressed concerns about broad definitions um, because it is very comprehensive like the CCPA. Um, and a joint committee in Massachusetts has to issue a favorable or unfavorable report by February 5th of 2020. If the joint committee issues a favorable report, then the Massachusetts legislation could be passed without amendment. Um, if it gets an unfavorable report, it is likely that the legislation will not pass at all and would have to be revived in the following legislative session, which would I think would be 2021 for Massachusetts. Um, another interesting note for the Massachusetts legislation is that in contrast to the CCPA, the revenue threshold for the definition of a business is $10 million rather than $25 million. So if a company is doing business in Massachusetts, just note that there is a lower threshold um, for whether uh, you would fall under the purview of the Massachusetts law if it were to pass. Um, moving on, as Dave mentioned before, California, California CCPA is seeing a lot of amendments. Um, as we mentioned there, an amendment was passed that excludes the um, employment information from the definition of a consumer. There are also amendments that are refining the definition of personal information. So removing or explicitly saying X type of information does not fall under the definition of personal information. So for example, um, one amendment that was passed in October excludes publicly available information from the definition of personal information and it clarifies that de-identified or aggregate information is also not personal information. So we're seeing them, the uh, California legislature start to chip away, refine, maybe narrow some of the definitions to make the CCPA either more workable or just to provide clarification to businesses and consumers as to what, what the law is going to do and who is it, who's it is going to apply to. 
Now, I think just one final point on that with regards to New York. New York's draft legislation is pretty comprehensive. In fact, in many ways, is a little bit more comprehensive and broader than the CCPA. And traditionally, New York has taken a pretty leading a leading role on some cybersecurity measures. So, it's it's not um, too surprising that they are they're attempting to take somewhat of a leading role in the data privacy uh, landscape as well. I'll just note that we've got a couple questions that came in, and we'll make sure that we get to um, in the course of the next couple of slides um, as we talk to those points. Mm -hmm. uh, so, let's continue. All right. So, based on our review of the laws that have been passed, have stalled in state legislatures or the uh, issue creation of task forces, we think we're going to continue to see a piecemeal approach among the states regarding data privacy. Um, it seems that they are taking their time to see what what's going to happen with California, what may happen at the federal level um, before acting fully. Um, one of the other things we noted was that bills that had been expected to pass failed to do so. So we talked about the Texas bills, also New York and Washington. Um, as Dave mentioned for New York had an even more comprehensive bill than the CCPA. So did Washington and Minnesota um, based on the amount of consumer rights and business obligations that those bills would have afforded. Um, and even though many people expected those bills to pass in those respective states, they failed to do so. Um, we are also seeing that there are a lot of interested parties that are participating in the legislative process. So businesses are expressing their concerns, small businesses are expressing concerns, industries, um, consumers. So there are a lot of parties and positions that the legislatures have to have to consider when creating their their approaches. Mm -hmm. um, we already covered that some states have elected to take a slower approach by creating task forces and then moving on to next steps. Um, and we've also seen out of, obviously we haven't covered all 25 states that have proposed data privacy legislation um, in the past couple of years, but some of those states have proposed narrower data privacy laws rather than one large comprehensive bill like the CCPA. So some states have targeted certain industries such as insurance or um, education, other fields, rather than create these large acts like mm -hmm. with the GDPR or CCPA. And I think one of the things also to keep in mind is that we, that it, while it has the federal legislature, Congress has been taking action over a number of years that have has started to to move them towards a, a federal privacy act. During 2018 legislature, for example, we saw, you know, almost a half dozen different acts proposed by various legislatures that had a, a variety of different comprehensive sectoral models designed um, some modeled after the GDPR, some modeled much more narrowly, but we've seen the federal legislature take a much more active role in the past couple of years because they are responding to their constituents who are who are saying, I have 50 state breach notification laws. I'm getting up to now almost 25 state data privacy laws. I've got HIPAA. I've got high tech. I have FCPA. I have all of these requirements. You need to simplify it. You need to give me a federal statute that preempts all of that, so that I know with certainty how that I can be how I can be compliant. And that, in some ways, Congress has tried to take that step. Of course, it it has been trying to take that step for a while. And reconciling all of the different kind of um, models together is is what I I expect to be what I anticipate as the issue um, when we're talking about individual rights and individual consent and balancing that with the practicalities of a business that needs that information in order to um, survive and thrive. So there is that kind of federal legislature that's kind of hanging out there. And I think one of the things, um, and this comes in response to a question um, that, that comes, that ties into this legislation and laws the question is uh, and i'll repeat it for the for the benefit of the group are you familiar with dod cmmc the Cybersecurity maturity model certification as dod's new certification is created how do you see this impacting 
the broader nationwide move towards greater levels of data and cyber security. So yes, we're familiar with the CMMC, um, the cyber, again, for the benefit of the group, the cybersecurity maturity model certification. That is something that the DOD has um, taken the initiative on over the past year or so, and they've done a couple road shows and solicited comments. I believe just the last week or the week prior, um, a new draft version, I wanna say 0 0.6 was released for comment to the public. Um, and just for an overview, essentially the Department of Defense is going to make it as part of its evaluation criteria that um, people who are uh, entities that are submitting their proposals um, have with it their level of CMC, CMMC certification and there will be third-party auditors that are out there that will come in take a look at your entity and assign it essentially a one through five one being your basic cyber hygiene five being um, incredibly well buttoned up you've checked all of the boxes with regards to cybersecurity, and it'll be an evaluation criteria that will become much more of um, a foundational aspect of what you are submitting and while it is the dod that is taking the initiative we do anticipate that that is going to eventually trickle out into the other agencies and become somewhat of a uniform standard. The DOD in this particular sense is a little unique in the sense that they are going to um, help offset some of that that's going to be an acceptable cost. And, and so there is a little bit of wiggle room to allow small businesses to recoup some of the expenses with coming into compliance with that CMMC and the standards that are set forth therein. And as a side note, the standards are based in part on the NIST 800-171 along with some ISO certifications and things along those lines. So, but to answer the question, how do we see this impacting the broader nationwide move? And while that is more in the cybersecurity context, as we talked about at the beginning, cybersecurity and data privacy really do overlap in a lot of material ways. So I see the DOD CMMC's um, creation really advancing the dialogue most specifically within government contracting. Government contracting, DOD leads the way in a lot of these aspects. And I would anticipate that other agencies are going to promulgate rules, regulations that are going to impact the FAR, that are going to find their way into solicitations and they're going to find their way into contracts. And so cybersecurity posture is going to be something that is normalized, if that makes sense. Again, as I spoke at the beginning, it's going to become similar to taxes. It's going to become eventually, not second nature, but something that is just an accepted cost of doing business. This is just what we have to do. And a critical piece of the standards and the controls that are set forth in the CMMC relates specifically to data privacy. Do you have these policies? Do you have um, this uh, employee training, are you following these standards and regulations within the data privacy piece is an evaluation criteria within the CMMC. So I would say that within the government contracting community, it is certainly um, the bell cow leading the way. On a broader sense, I'm not sure that it's going to have any sort of material impact with regards to, let's say, just the private sector with a standard commercial business. I think, frankly, that the industry organizations have already taken the lead on that and that the CMMC is really part of DOD's way to, to play catch up. So um, that answers that question. So I'm going to move on. Here we go. Um, strategies and recommendations for compliance. You know, there's a a lot of information out there there's a lot of statutes and regulations and contractual requirements and and government guidance and industry standards and court cases that are going to inform how all of these pieces come together but the the crux of it really begins with identify where you operate do you do business in california do you do business in texas or maine or massachusetts where do you operate and that's as simple as, you know, do you have an office there? Do you have a contract there? A lot of that, if you think of it, if you pay taxes there, that's there's a good, there's a 
good probability that you quote operate there. What information do you have? What personally identifiable information do you have? What information do you really need? This is the information that I have. Do I really need all of that? And how long do I need that? One of the big things that we recommend is, you know, to information destruction policies. After a certain period of time, you don't need the social security number of somebody who walked through your door, say, 10 years ago. You just don't need that anymore. So it's an undue risk and it's unnecessary for you to keep um, holding on to that risk when it's as simple as really taking the proper steps to destroy that information. So understanding and getting your arms around where I operate, what industry, what physical location, what statutes, regulations, and contract contractual requirements apply to me, what information do I have, and what information do I really need. So understanding your business and doing that own due diligence are all things that you can do internally before you have to reach out and expend any sort of resources. Because the next point here is allocate risk and resources. It's there are a, we have a, a whole list of things that we recommend. You know. Vendor management plan is is top among them. That's why it's next on this bullet list. But privacy policies, employee trainings, you have your CCPA specific notice. You have notice of opt-in. You have notice of opt-out. There's bring your own device policies. There's a lot of those different policies that come into play, the trainings, the implementations, the enforcement, the constant need to keep those refreshed is can be quite taxing on any business, let alone a small business that's not going to have the resources at this time to do that. But after you've done your due diligence, you've identified the areas and you can prioritize them to start allocating resources and you say, well, I have a lot of um, you know, healthcare information. So I really need to understand the security rule and the privacy rule that are enacted under the HIPAA legislation. So I'm gonna pour some resources into that. After I'm done that, then I'm gonna go down my priority, my, my priority list and I'm gonna bring up the next piece. Okay, I actually need to think about high tech. I need to think about COPPA. I need to think about these other um, regulatory requirements. What states am I really doing business? Do I need to do business in those? So you can allocate the risk and resources, time, money, employee engagement, those types of things. Vendor management, we get this one a lot because the third parties that you interact with, that you share information with, pose the largest threat that you have no control over. And there are countless examples the the most kind of tried and true is the target breach that happened a number of years ago in which the sensitive information that was breached was through the HVAC vendor that got in through the PO point of sale system that got into target. Well, you didn't hear necessarily about all of those other parties that caused the breach. You just heard about target, about their landmark damages, about their reputation and about the issues that came not even directly from their actions, but really from their failure to manage their vendors, to inspect what you expect, to enforce contractual obligations, to pursue their compliance, and really, if you're a prime, really inspecting your sub, if you're a sub, looking at your lower tier sub, and making sure that the whole supply chain is secured, that's a pretty important piece of the pie. Continued compliance, Again, this is one of those, you put it down, you've got to come back to it every quarter, every year, you've got to make sure that what you put in place at day one makes sense on day 361, 366, you know, two more years down the road. This is a continuing aspect, particularly because of the volatile nature of this landscape right now. We, as, as Emily wonderfully noted, we are going to get a lot more statutes and regulations coming about and so it's important to just stay on top of it um, we are hope to continue to do some webinars to give updates throughout the next year um, but really kind of getting getting your feet under you and that this is not a a once and done kind of proposition um, just as an aside we have Polaro Maza has done a podcast on cybersecurity issues related to false claims act other government contracting issues and other commercial issues that is available um, on our website and, and I imagine wherever um, you get your favorite podcasts. And as a final plug, we do offer um, a low fee cyber compliance checkup plan to help you just with that step one 
understanding where you are in relation to the entire regulatory landscape so that you can make informed decisions on how to allocate risk amongst your business. Um, at this time, we're just about done. No other questions have come in. And if we haven't gotten to your question, we'll make sure to um, reach out to you directly. But that is about it. We're just right on time. If you have any questions either now or in the future, always feel free to reach out to either one of us or any contact that you may have at Polaro Maza, and we'll make sure to answer um, all of your questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. All right. Have a great day. Alex Scott.